Pastor Dr. Reginald Van Stevens. What does it mean to persevere? If I'm calling on you, if I'm encouraging you to persevere, what does it mean to persevere? How is it possible to persevere in the faith given what we have to be faced with today? And all of us are faced with something. All of us are, are tempted by something. All of us, are, 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 the devil is trying to discourage us with something to get us to fall away from the faith. But how is it possible to do it? Regardless of whether you have ongoing hardships or the devil trying to pull you in a different direction or by worldly standards you're comfortable and you honestly have gotten successful because you know there are all kinds of distractions. But how can I persevere, Pastor? First thing you got to be is determined to follow Christ. Don't ever estimate determination. Hold to your Christian convictions. You can do it. The devil says you can't, but yes, you can. You can hold to your Christian convictions despite all of the other kinds of things that are designed to discourage you. Even when Jesus was on earth in the flesh, there were some who were first excited about being his disciples, who eventually decided to distance themselves or fall away from him. Why? Because of the requirements of his words. Let me give you one good example. In John 6, he says, if you won't follow me, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. They said, oh. They didn't remain long enough to learn what he meant with his metaphorical expression. He was talking about or teaching about how to have real life and be sustained in this life's journey. They were just finishing up a talk, if you go back and read John 6, about the manna that God sent down from heaven to get his people through the wilderness. You got to keep stuff in context. Some people fall away from the faith because they don't stay along, around long enough to find out what you're really talking about, what is really behind it. They take things out of context. And when it's taken out of context, the devil can mess you up. How many people you know have left the church because something they taken out of its context, its proper context? And, they, and the devil got you just like that. Today, a few fall away because they don't understand completely what they are hearing as simply requirements of the faith. They don't stay long enough to learn what they don't immediately understand because they don't allow the word of God to become deeply rooted in themselves. If you want to stay, you got to be determined. If you want to persevere, you got to be convicted and convinced. Welcome to the White Rock Baptist Church Worship Experience. Led by our dynamic pastor, the Reverend Dr. Reginald Van Stevens, we invite you to join us each and every Sunday as we welcome the world to Christ. If you're in Durham, North Carolina, we'd love to have you join us in person on Sundays at 9.15 a.m. for a wonderful time in worship and in the Word. At White Rock, we believe that families are strengthened and lives are transformed through service and proclamation of His gospel. Our Wednesday seasons of prayer and Bible discovery classes will empower and equip you to serve the Lord. But that's not all. We have dozens of ministries to meet the needs of White Rock members in the surrounding community. Our ministries for children, teens, women, men, and couples enrich the lives of those inside and outside the church. 
White Rock Ministries provide food to those in need, support those dealing with life challenges and grief, and create opportunities to discover and grow in God's collective purpose for our lives. For specific details on our ministries, prayer times, and Bible studies, please visit www.whiterockbaptistchurch.org. Thank you for spending time with us today, and we look forward to seeing you again as we persevere in the faith. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Good morning, White Rock Baptist Church. Come on, stand to your feet and let's give God some Sunday morning praise.
bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Within me, and oh, that is, that is within me. Bless his holy name. unequaled greatness, praise him with the blast of the ram's horn, praise him with the tambourine and dancing, praise him with string and flute, praise him, praise the Lord, praise him with loud clanging cymbals, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, amen. Let us go to the Lord as we Call him into our hearts. Oh, dear God. 
Heavenly Father, you have called us unto yourself, and we come with hearts filled with gratitude and love for you, O oh God. We gather to lift our voices now and our hearts to praise you and to thank you. Lord, you have guided and led us this whole week, and we just give you all the praise, honor, and glory. Join our hearts now, O oh God, to you and to one another in love as we continue to lift your name, Lord, and dedicate this service unto you. We give you all praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Sister Cheryl. Good morning, White Rock. Well, today is um, our Back to School Sunday with W.G. Pearson, who's just across the street from us. Uh, we always su um, supply um, school supplies for them every year. This year, they are now year-round, so their school starts tomorrow. So I'd like to thank everyone who gave and ones who didn't. You have some time until August 15th to bring your school supplies to us so we can help the little people. So at this time, we'd like to have um, Principal Dorsey come up and speak and introduce the, um, some of the visitors that came with him today. Good morning, White Rock. Good morning. How are you all this morning? Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Amen. I am so honored to be here. I am uh, Principal Kendall Dorsey, Principal of W.G. Pearson, and I want to thank some of my staff members that are here, so I'm just going to briefly have you all stand. Um, first of all, I want to give um, honor to your pastor, your esteemed pastor. Thank you as well to Ms. Cheryl and the cast team. You all have been just a wonderful support. And just to introduce some of the folks that are here with us, first of all, my assistant principal is here, Mrs. Christy Hall. Shout out to her, thank you for being here. And then Mrs. Lucy Williams is a new IA that's coming to us. Our dynamic third grade, now fourth grade math teacher, Mr. Fitzroy Russell. And our amazing fifth grade language arts teacher, Ms. Nicole Hudson McDermott. So thank you all for being with us today. We truly appreciate it. You all can sit. We are excited. We are going into a new school year, and I've told you all, you know, as we come every year, this is starting year three for us, and it is amazing as a new admin team. We've got some news. Amen. We've got some news. There's, as it was mentioned, we are going to be a year-round school. Uh, but, you know, when we took over a couple of years ago, um, we were at a D. And so I do believe if preliminary results hold, we will now be a C school. And, and so I just want you to know that we are working hard. And so I want to thank partners, partners like White Rock, partners, I see her in the back, like Dr. Linda Hubbard Curtis, partners that are in the, yes, come on, let's clap it up for her. Um, partners like that help us make it happen. And so I want to thank you. You have been an important part of what we have done, providing school supplies, a luncheon during Teacher Appreciation Week, because baby, that chicken salad, bless my soul. Uh, we get, <laughs> but on and on, and so we thank you for the partnership. And so tomorrow is the first day of school. The, the, I know, right? We said the same thing. <laughs> so if anybody just happens to be available or have some time at 7.15 to 7.45 tomorrow morning, uh, feel free to come over. Say you're from White Rock. We want to have uh, folks all outside just excited and welcoming the children into our school building. And we, we do it big over there. So we're going to have the music blaring and we're going to have a good time. And we're going to start an even bigger year. And we are going to go higher because we've got to be greater together. 
And so I'm so proud of the staff and of the students and the families of our school, and it takes all of us. And so, you know, the question sometimes becomes, what do you do or how do we do it? And yes, it's about being greater together, but now I could tell the truth over here at White Rock. Is the truth is Psalms 27 and 7 says, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And so we will continue to go forth from here. Thank you, White Rock. Thank you, White Rock. Thank you, Sister Cheryl, and all of our school officials here today. Thank you for being here today. We bless you. And we thank all of you for your participation in bringing supplies for our children and for our school. Thank you so much. I am pleased now, this is Youth Emphasis Sunday, and I am pleased to introduce our youth participants. I will introduce Reese Merriweather and Ellis Merriweather, son and daughter of Deacon, Deacon Kurt Merriweather and sister Valerie Merriweather. This is Reese's first time, and we just thank her and her brother for being here today as we do all of our young people who participate. Won't you come, Reese? Good morning. My name is Reese Merriweather, and I am pleased to read scripture from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 46 through 48. I will read from the New Living Translation, and it reads, Then his disciples began arguing about which of them was the greatest, but Jesus knew their thoughts, so he brought a little child to his side. Then he said to them, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me also welcomes my Father who sent me. Whoever is the least among you is the greatest. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. My name is Ellis Mary with you, and I'm pleased to offer morning prayer. Everyone bow their heads and close their eyes. Father God, we praise you for your greatness and love. You are our creator and God. We admit our mistakes and ask for your forgiveness. Help us to follow your path. We thank you for all the blessings in our lives, our families, our communities, and the opportunities we have each day. We ask for your help and protection. Keep our children and young people safe and love. Bring those who don't know you to experience your love and salvation. Bring peace, understanding to our country, and guide us with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, I love you. Yes, I love you. How I love you. I really love you. Just for who you are. 
in all of your glory my heart sings holy holy you are everything I need you to be you are the great I am Lord I praise you yes I praise you how I praise you I really praise you just for who you are in all of your glory. My heart sings holy, holy. You are everything I need you to be you are the great I Really love you. I really love you just for who you are. Just for who you are. In all your glory. My heart sings. Hallelujah. 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 You are everything. You are everything I need you to be. for all you've done for waking me up this morning for starting me on my way 
for giving me the breath of life. I want to thank you. I want to thank you. Yeah. You are the great. sleeping in my grave. You are the great. You are, you are. You are the great. You are the great. I am. You are the great I am. You are the great I am. You are great I am. You are the great I am. You are the great I am. He is the great he is. We serve an awesome God. 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 Do you serve an awesome God? Why don't you lift your hand and say we serve an awesome God? And we give him glory, and we give him glory, and we give him honor, and we tell him thank you, and we tell him thank you, 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 hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Somebody tell him thank you. Somebody tell him thank you. He's a worthy God. He's a worthy God. He's a worthy God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. 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 Amen. You are the great. There is no one greater. Amen. Than the Lord Jesus himself. Amen. We thank God for the 
choir singing so beautiful this morning. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know you could sing like that, man. Hey, in the morning, yeah. Hey, God. Amen. Amen. We thank God for being in this house one more time. Uh, just thank God for God being God. Um, thank God just for uh, my pastor who entrusts us as associates to cover the pulpit. I count that as an honor and a privilege, realizing that he could have many named um, uh, ministers and preachers, but he has entrusted us to, to cover the pulpit. So I thank God for him and his mentorship and leadership. Amen. Thank God for W.G. Pearson, Principal Dorsey, for being in service with us today. Thank God for our sister Kimberly Sherrill, who's done a beautiful job with the cast ministry, and all those who work with her as well. Thank God for you. Thank God for your progress as your fellow DPS colleague. I know that is not an easy thing to come by. In times like this, we have so many shortages and trying to figure out who's going to cover what. Amen. So God bless you all and your hard work. And as you go into your first day tomorrow, amen. Amen. Thank God for our young people. Uh, thank God for Reese and Ellis, who did a beautiful job reading the scripture and also did a beautiful job with the prayer. We thank God for our young people. They are very active. They're, amen. They're very active. They're very involved. We have some who are in camps right now um, doing wonderful things. We have some who are active in sports. Uh, so let's keep them in prayer. Keep them in prayer. They're student athletes, so keep them in prayer as they're doing what they're doing. That God keeps their mind and their bodies as well. Amen. Amen. Um, I won't prolong the service. The, the scripture has been read. Um, I just want to draw your attention to a focus scripture, and that is verse 48. Then he said to them, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me also welcomes my Father who sent me. Whoever is the least among you is the greatest. The title of the sermon today is, Who is the Goat? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being in your house one more time. Now, Lord, as we share in your word, Lord, we ask you that you would enlighten our minds and empower our hearts, that you would give us understanding, Lord, as, as to what we are hearing in your word today, Lord. Lord, we realize that you are the Alpha and Omega. You are the great. And Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. And Lord, we give you honor and praise because it belongs to you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the blessed Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before I get into the sermon, I want to draw your attention to one of these beautiful window panes um, that we have here in the church. The one that I want to draw your attention to is the one that's on my left, which will probably be your right, but... It is the first section of window panes here. Um, and it's the third one. The very top one is just a design. The second one says, ye praise the Lord. And the third one is a picture of a lamb on the Bible. And I just want to draw your attention to that lamb on the Bible. And at the end of the sermon, we will revisit the lamb. Amen. 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 That's the teacher in me. Amen. Amen. Who is the GOAT? Oftentimes, we have many discussions about who is the GOAT in different areas of entertainment or sports in our country. And many times, it happens in our barbershops. Um, you know, many times, I remember growing up, going to the barbershop, you would hear a variety of discussions on who is the greatest in just different categories. I don't go to the bar, I, I go to a barbershop, but you know, I've gotten a little bougie now. You know, I go to, uh, I make appointments to go to the barbershop. <laughs> and it's a one-on-one -on -one interaction. I come in there, my, my barber knows me so well, you know, she has the jazz playing for me when I come in there. It's like going to a spa. Um, <laughs> But I do remember growing up in a barbershop, you would hear these different debates about who was the GOAT, LeBron James, Michael, Jeffrey Jordan. 
You know, we get into debate on, on, on who is the GOAT. And many times you will hear people make their arguments. They would say, well, Michael Jordan is 6-0 in the finals. You know, LeBron James, you know, they would talk about, you know, his longevity and how he's done stuff no one else has done. He has the scoring title. He's top five in every, you know, category uh, that there's a stat for. And they would go back and forth, back and forth, and I would find it so entertaining um, because they made some good arguments. I mean, you would think maybe LeBron is the goal, or maybe, you know, but then you, you, you can't let your eyes fool you because I, I grew up in the era of Michael Jordan as a kid, and I always tell young people, I, I, I know you see LeBron James as your GOAT, but I know what I saw with Michael Jeffrey Jordan. And I said, there will never be one that's like Michael Jeffrey Jordan from Wilmington, North Carolina. And there's a variety of different debates that we get into. Sometimes it goes, it trickles down to music. You know, who is the, 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 the best entertainer or who is the best uh, pop artist? Is it Prince in Purple Rain? Or is it Michael Jackson and Billie Jean? You know, we get into their catalog. Who has the deepest catalog? You know, who is the best entertainer? Who is the best performer? And then we go back and forth, depending on who we like the most. And then we go, we can get into hip hop, we get into Tupac and Biggie, and looking at that argument and seeing who is the greatest, who had the best diss song, you know, who shot you, or you know, who, 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 who is the greatest? Is, is it Tupac or is it Biggie? And then we go on, and sometimes we can get into debate of Jay Z versus Nas. I'm biased. I'm a Nas fan growing up, so I thought Nas was, the, you know, he, I thought he was the better uh, artist, especially based off that particular beef where he wrote the legendary Ether and Ether Jay-Z. And then we can get even to the modern day debates. We look at Kendrick Lamar and we look at Drake and we see some of these debates that have happened, but I think we all can agree that between the two, we know who is the better one. Amen. Um, I've, 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 I've never seen in my lifetime, I know there are some people here who are older, but I've never seen in the history of hip hop someone get eviscerated the way Kendrick Lamar did Drake. But we get into all these different debates about Ken, you know, of who is the greatest. Is it this person? Is it that person? We make our arguments, but I'm here to present to you today that I truly believe in the old saying that comparison is the thief of joy. It is not possible or, or is it possible that we debate and argue about who is the goat and when we get into these arguments is it not possible that we are robbed of appreciating their individual brilliance and contribution to their respective fields. Could it, could, it, could it be possible that as we argue about LeBron and, and, and argue about Michael that they're just both great? Could it be possible that when we argue about Prince and Michael Jackson that they're just both great at what they did? But sometimes we get into the debate and the arguments over who is the great and miss the beauty of what they contributed to their respective fields. And in verse 46, the scripture says, there we go. In verse 46, the scripture says, then his disciples began arguing about which of them was the greatest. I think this is important because then is a powerful word. It says, then his disciples. And I wanted to know about what happened before that. In the above section of scripture, Jesus predicts his death, and in the midst of, G of, of Jesus predicting his death, he's letting them know what's about to happen to him. And this is not the first time in chapter 9 that he shares or predicts his, death, um, predicts his death, but it's the second time that he has done this in this particular chapter. And their response is to selfishly look among themselves to determine who is the greatest. The issue wasn't their lack of understanding, because 
there's a lot of things that sometimes we don't understand because it's not that the timing is not right. It could be your age, you being a young person, being a child. Maybe there are there's some things that you haven't lived enough life to understand yet, and that's okay. There are some of us adults who still don't understand things that, we, that we're supposed to understand. But the issue was their response to a lack of understanding. That was the issue. The issue was their response to a lack of understanding. And I like to use this example. I remember I was, uh, when, when, when I was in a classroom, I had a student. And this particular student, he was strong in math. When it came to, to discussing math, he, his hand was the first one that would go up. He was engaged, he was involved in, in, in the lesson. Um, but what I noticed is that when the period changed and we moved to talking about English, and we had to start talking about those elements of, of, of literature and, and, and breaking down characterization, alliteration, and, and, and forecasting, foreshadow, all those different things that we started you know, having to unpack. This same student, who was probably the best student in my class, all of a sudden turned into, turned into a tornado. You know, he began, you no, know, he played football, so he would begin to uh, tease some of his classmates who played football, talking about, you know, I run a better route than you, I'm faster than you, I do this better than you. And I would look at him, I said, man, what does that have to do with what, 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 what we're talking about right now? And he would say, no, you just don't understand, and he would just carry on and carry on and carry on. And one day I pulled him to the side, and I said, hey, man, what's, what's, what's going on? Um, and he said, well, you know, I, I, I don't get what you're talking about. And I said, so due to your lack of understanding, your response is to turn my class into a tornado. And he said, well, I didn't look at it that way. I said, well, that's how I'm looking at it, because what you're doing is preventing all these other kids in here from learning what they need to learn. And in turn, you're also preventing your own self from getting the understanding that you need so that you can know what's going on. And we had this discussion and we talked a little bit. And after we talked, we sort of came to the conclusion that maybe we can look at some strategies to help you understand things a little bit better. Me as a teacher, how can I teach you so that you can understand what I'm saying? And one of the things that I, I really saw in him um, in that process was fear. Because you don't want to let people know that you don't know what you don't know. So fear sometimes can make us act out in ways that we shouldn't when we don't know something. So we begin to want to change the topic and talk about something that we do know. And in this situation, fear made them look outside of themselves to compare who is the greatest. And I sort of understand a little bit why they got into this argument, because if you read this whole chapter now, you can do so in your free time. There were some really cool things that happened here. The first cool thing was that Jesus, at the beginning of chapter 9, he gave them power. He gave them power to cast out demons, do all these different things. So here are these new followers of Christ, and now you have the power of Christ operating in you. The same power to, you know, to cast out demons, do miracles. Jesus has empowered them with that. And then the second thing that happens is that, you know, the, the big three, Peter, John, and James, they go into the mountain with Jesus where he's transfigured. And Jesus is up there. Um, he's transfigured and he looks, you know, sort of angelic. And he sees Moses and Elijah. And they're all up there transfigured, um, you know, looking heavenly. And these three, the big three, see this and says, Lord, we should make an altar here. It's, it's good for us to be here. Let us stay here. And they're seeing all these different things. And, and you got to remember, these are colonized uh, uh, believers. They're living in, the, in a country that is colonized, so they don't have equal rights. They don't have, they're, 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 they're seeing all this, and in their mind, they're translating it to, oh, okay, now we got power to overcome the empire. You know, we, me, me, Jesus, disciples, we're going to ride on our horses, and, you know, we're going to do like King David did in the Old Testament. And they're processing this, and they're looking at who is the greatest. Because in their minds, King David was the greatest king. Elijah was the greatest prophet. Moses was the greatest leader. So in their mind, they have equated who is the greatest as to, well, who's going to be the greatest among us? 
Peter, James, John. No, we with Jesus transfigured. We came down the mountain, and y'all couldn't cast out the demons. Can you imagine that conversation that they're having? Is that they come down from the mountain to Jesus, and they look at their, the other nine disciples who cannot cast out a demon in, in, in the boy that was possessed with a demon. And you can imagine that maybe in their human flesh that they, they, they could be looking down on the other nine disciples, thinking, oh, okay, y'all couldn't do it. If I was here, it would have happened. And sometimes we can get caught up in these meaningless debates and discussions and miss the purpose. Because our eyes are distracted, our hearts are deceived, our minds are manipulated by our fears. And I like verse 47, because in verse 47, Jesus says, I knew their thoughts. So he brought a little child to his side. You know, it's okay to be lost and lack understanding. But the key is to stay in the presence of Jesus we got to give these disciples some credit because a lot of times, many of us, when we, you know, encounter these situations where we're being called out, it could be in school where you're dealing with the teacher or a principal, it could be with your parents, it could be with an authority figure, and sometimes we resort to this defensive mechanism of uh, looking at fight or flight. Sometimes we fight the very person or resource that God has sent into our lives to help us for where God has purposed us to be. And we can, we can fight these people and, 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 and we can think we know what's best because in our minds we're operating out of our fears without realizing that your help is right there in front of you. But sometimes your help doesn't look like what you have predetermined in your mind. Sometimes for us our help is about uh, seeking out what makes us feel comfortable. Sometimes it's, it's seeking out what makes us feel convenient. Who's going to cater to us and make us feel like we are, 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 are receiving things that fit our own insecurities? And sometimes what God is trying to do, he's trying to draw light to your insecurities. He's trying to bring you out of your defensiveness and say, here, here is my light. Let me shine into it because this will help you shine and fulfill the purpose that I've placed in your life. And that's what we're dealing here when we're talking about these disciples who are navigating this process, but we have to give them credit because they stayed in the presence of Jesus. Oftentimes, what do many of us do when we come up against things that make us feel uncomfortable, when we come against someone that speaks truth to power, and in our minds, we think, well, no, that's not right, but it's the truth. It's the very truth that'll set you free. It's the very truth that will liberate you from bad habits. It's the very truth that will deliver you from addictions and things that you've been struggling with for years. And it's the very truth that will give you the deliverance that you need. And we look at it and we say, no, 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 that's not it. That's not it. But I like what Jesus does in verse 48. Because as these disciples sit among him and as they're processing everything that is going on and as they're hearing what Jesus is saying, Jesus has brought this little child into the picture to make an example of what he's trying to point out to him. And Jesus says, then he said to them, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me and anyone who welcomes me also welcomes my father who sent me. Whoever is the least among you is the greatest. I love this scripture, and I didn't realize how much depth was in it until I really looked into it for myself. And I hear what Jesus is saying in this scripture, especially as we look at the times that we're living in and how society has sort of deemed things of, 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 of how they view things to be the greatest. Society tells us greatness is measured not just by strength, but by the exploitation of strength as it relates to dominating others. This doesn't just translate to sports and, and, and entertainment, but it also translates to a society that measures strength by those people who have power and how they exploit the weak for their own gain. The goat becomes a symbol of oppression. I will exploit poor communities by redlining black and brown communities and devaluing your property value 
And then for kicks and giggles, I will then come back and buy your property for pennies on a dime and call it a beautification project. When really, I'm gentrifying your neighborhoods and kicking you out and displacing you with nowhere to live. That's what our society does when they're looking at who defines the GOAT. That's what the GOAT does. They will have celebrities, rich celebrities, get up like Amber Rose and the Coon Squad, convince you that voting for a man that's broken more laws than a drug dealer is the rightful leader of this country. That's how they define who the GOAT is. And it's important for us as Christians to have our spiritual lenses on to be able to sift between what we're singing and what's being presented to us. And Jesus uses this child to model our behavior as Christians. Why? Why does he use this child to, to, to teach the disciples? Because a child is completely dependent upon its parent for everything. A child is dependent upon his parent to feed them. A child is dependent upon a parent to put clothes on their back. A child is, 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 is dependent upon a parent to give them wise counsel, wise advice, to, you know, to, to help them with what's going on in their different activities. A child is dependent upon their parent for everything until they can get to the place to where they can be independent. That's why Jesus brought this child into their presence because Jesus wanted them to know that you have to be dependent upon me for everything. Yes. Society would tell you that, that, you know, to be the goat, that you have to, you know, be this independent person. It's, uh, it's me. It's my own strong will. It's my own strong determination. And don't get me wrong, it takes hard work. Faith without works is dead. You got to do some work. But you can't do nothing without being completely dependent upon the living power of our God. And that's why Jesus brings in this child in the midst of them arguing about who is the greatest among us, who is the goat. And Jesus knows their thoughts. Jesus knows that they don't understand. Jesus knows that because at this time it's not time for them to understand everything yet. But as they argue about who is the goat, Jesus brings in this child who is completely dependent, who, only, who, who needs a, an adult to tell them what to do at every step. Isn't that like us? We, we, we need God to tell us what to do at every step. Our nation needs God right now to tell us what to do at every step. Because if we knew what to do, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in right now. There wouldn't be so much chaos and division, this group against that group. This, this politician against that politician. Everyone's so divided. People are so confused and lost. You don't know whether they're coming or going. And then what happens is the enemy makes you exhausted. When you're looking for who to go with is, the enemy makes you exhausted. And then you start saying things like, well, it ain't important to vote because I'm tired. I'm exhausted. That's because you're looking out who to go with is. You're searching for it in a person. And God is trying to direct our attention to something different. Because society looks at, at people as determining who the savior or who the goat is. God's power dynamic is different. God takes that power dynamic and he flips it upside down. And he says, you're looking for the goat. Let me draw your attention to a different acronym. And that is the lamb. That is the least among my brethren. That's who we should be searching for. You're looking for the greatest of all time. The greatest of all time is limiting. Think about that. If, 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 if you're the greatest, that means you have achieved the supreme power. There's only one supreme power in, the, in this world. Why would you limit yourself to the greatest when in God's hand, there's no limit? There's no limit to what you can do. And the world would desire to limit you, young people, and, and, and tell you that this is all you can be. All you can be is that kid from a, from, from, from a Dougal Terrace who, who has no access to resources. All you can be is poor, broken, disgusted. All you can be is someone who has debt and, 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 and will never be financially free. All you can be is what society tells you can be. Jesus takes that dynamic, flips it upside down, says you can be whatever you want to be. You just got to change who you're looking at. You're looking for the goat and I am the lamb. I am the lamb. The irony of all this is while they're discussing who is the goat, the lamb was among them. <laughs> Lord have mercy.
I wish I could preach this the way I wanted to. I wish I could preach this the way I wanted to. But the lamb was sitting there among them while they were arguing about who would be greatest among them. The lamb was sitting in their presence. Lord, have mercy. When you read some of these scriptures uh, of uh, Revelation 17 and 14, it says they will make war against the lamb. But the lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords, king of kings, and with him will be called his chosen and faithful believers. I don't want to stop there. Revelation 15 and 3 says, And sang the song, God's servant Moses and the Lamb, great and marvelous are your deeds. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, king of the nations. I don't want to stop there. Revelation 13 and 8 says, And all the people who belong to this world worship the beast. They are the ones whose names were now written in the book of life that belongs to the Lamb, who was slaughtered before the world was made. I don't want to stop there. Isaiah 53 and 7 says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. I'm here to tell you that today the lamb is in your presence. I don't know what you're going through. There may be some people in here that may have tried to discourage you. There may be some people who have told you you are limited based off where you come from. There may be uh, uh, people who have tried to discourage you on your job and your schools, but I'm here to tell you that the Lamb is here today. And he has come to flip the dynamic that the world has presented to us. He has come to let you know that while the world is searching for the greatest of all time, I've come to search for the least among you. I've come to search for someone that has a heart for me. I've come to search for someone who doesn't care about the things that this world cares about, but they care about me. I've come that you might have life and have might more abundantly. I've come that you might be set free. The goat wants you to be bound, but the lamb wants you to be liberated. The goat wants you to be stuck in, in, in mental health illness, but the, but the lamb wants you to be free to do whatever I've called you to do. The goat wants you to keep walking in circles like the children of Israel in the wilderness, but the lamb wants you to get to where I purpose you to. The goat wants you to be so bound up that you can't see left from right, but the lamb wants you to see that I am, I am he. I am he. I am the one that has died for your sins. I am the one that has, that, 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 that has given you an opportunity to have everlasting life. I am the lamb. God bless you. Amen. We thank God because the Lamb is among us, not just in that beautiful uh, stained glass window that we have here, but He's here among us. He's here. And if there's anyone here today who would like to meet the Lamb, maybe you've been broken by some of the things in our society and how they place value on who the gold is, but I'm here to tell you the Lamb is here. And our society may place emphasis on the wrong things because we're searching for answers outside of ourselves. But the word tells me that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. So our doors are open to you today. If you're unsaved, we invite you to Christ today and walk down the Romans road and confess Christ that you might receive him in your heart. If you're looking for a church home, we invite you to come and join us. Give the deacon your hand, but give God your heart. And he will do exceedingly and abundantly more than you could ever imagine. Because on today, it is about the lamb. I don't care what we see in our society. I don't care what politics or entertainment has to say. We have to keep the main thing the main thing. And know that it is Christ who will help us out of this mess that we're in. It's his will. 
but we have to give our hearts to him and let him do the work. Amen. He is Lord. Every every knee shall and every tongue. Every tongue that Jesus. That Jesus. Jesus Christ. God bless you. shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What a word, Reverend Norwood, what a word. This may be you Sunday, but there was some meat in there for all of us. And now it is time that all of us can participate, continue to participate because we have been right in tune with the Holy Spirit, but as it's time now for us to bring our tithes and our offerings and our gifts unto God. You may come after the prayer and bring them to the baskets on each side of the sanctuary. And if you don't feel like walking today, you can just raise your hand and one of the ushers will come and get it for you. If you're not in the sanctuary but still hearing this service, there are other ways that you can bring your tithes and your offerings. You can come by the church office during the church office hours between Monday and Thursday and bring your gifts unto God. You can give through your financial institution. You can give through Givelify, PayPal, your tithes and your offerings. You can call the church and have one of our wonderful trustees to come and pick it up to give your tithes and your offerings. So now as we come unto God cheerfully, not begrudgedly, but cheerfully bringing our tithes and offerings into the storehouse as God has commanded us to do. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your messenger. I thank you, Lord, for speaking to him and through him. I thank you, oh, Heavenly Father, that as we bring our tithes and our offerings before you, God, that you will continue to bless us. For, Lord, we are truly a blessed people. You have blessed us mightily, Lord, and it's not about money, but it's about your blessings. 
You have blessed us, Father, emotionally, spiritually, financially, health-wise. Your comfort, your joy, your peace, God. We are a blessed people. And for that, Lord, we say thank you. And Father, as we cheerfully and joyfully come unto you to bring into the storehouse your tithes, your gifts, we ask you, Father, to continue to bless us, continue to keep us, and continue to love us and forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. And amen. Please rise and come and bring your tithes and your offerings. for the benediction. Now all oh, glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his glorious kingdom. We thank you, O oh God, for this time together. And as we prepare to leave, we pray, O oh God, that your spirit go with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
thank you for joining our worship experience. We look forward to seeing you again online next Sunday or in person at 915 in our sanctuary at 3400 Fayetteville Street, Durham, North Carolina. For information about White Rock Baptist Church, please visit our website at www.whiterockbaptistchurch.org or contact the church office at 919-688-8136. Until next time, may Christ Jesus continue to bless you and keep you until we meet again.